Listen, my children, you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. On the 18th of April in 75, hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. He said to his friend, if the British march by land or sea from the town tonight, hang a lantern aloft in the belfry arch of the North Church Tower as a signal light. One if by land, and two if by sea, and I on the opposite shore will be. to ride and spread the alarm through every Middlesex village and farm for the country folk to be up and to arm. Oh, bunk. You know, Helen, I think it's time for somebody to go upstairs. I still say bunk. <laughs> I'll take her. All right. Come on. Oh, Come on. They sure grow a lot heavier in a year. You should visit more often, Dad. Sandra's going nighty-night. Night-night, night, honey. Many. Come on. Those lucky New York Yanks. One stinking run in the night. You little Sam. Ten more minutes, then. I know. Nighty night. That's right. Heck, every time you come, I have to be a little Sam. I'll pack tonight. No. Gosh, wish you could live here all the time. And watch you grow up to be Big Sam and me Little Sam? Oh, no siree. You can tell me stories. Yeah, but the stories I tell are bunk. Oh, no, Gramps. Except Paul Revere and that lantern stuff. Well, you used to like it. But I was pretty young then. Yeah, that's right. Imagine Paul Revere trying to warn everyone in Ohio on a horse. Now the enemy had swoop in with super bombers. <laughs> 600 miles an hour. Bombs away! <laughs> Heck, Paul Revere couldn't even get on his horse that fast. <laughs> well, suppose Paul Revere were Paul Rankin. Dad? Now what? <laughs> Go back to your wall game, Paul. We were talking about you, not to you. Well, what about me? We were supposing you were Paul Revere. You could be Paul Revere, you know. A new model, that is. With a horse? Oh, Pop, you're not promising the kid a horse in the city here? Not the kind you mean, Paul. Here's your horse. Oh, Gramps. One if by land and two if by sea. Just dial and warn the countryside. That's what I mean by a modern Paul Revere, using today's war As an aircraft spotter? Among other civil defense duties. Gee, like you told me about World War II. Look, Pop, I don't like to make you look silly, but that's about as old-fashioned as Paul Revere. Ever hear of R-A-D-A-R? -A -A I've heard of it, yes. So has little Sam. Sure. Gives you a wonderful feeling of security to know that those big eyes are turning 24 hours a day, guarding the whole United States. And they're manned by the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, Coast Guards, Marines, checking every plane, every ship coming over to this country. But our enemies know about that radar screen, too. They're working on ways to get over or under it. And just in case they do get past the radar, we've got trained civilian observers spotted all over this country, on the alert night and day, just to make sure that not one enemy plane might sneak in without being detected. You went through all that bother during the war, and, and nothing happened. That's right. We were lucky then. It's been such a short time since World War II that many of us don't seem to realize how much scientific progress has been made even since then. Why now, with these new planes, the world has shrunk until the oceans are no bigger than Lake Erie. What happened to the oceans, Grandpa? <laughs> what Grandpa means, Sonny, is that nowadays planes can fly here from anywhere in the world. 
But there's no point in coming all that way just to bomb us. Have you forgotten what happened in England? One minute a nice, peaceful residential district and then... death and destruction. No doubt somebody said, why? Why bomb here of all places? They just made the wrong delivery, huh, Gramps? That's my boy. Yep, when the enemy begins to study maps with an eye to bombing targets, he looks for those huge industrial plants, shipping docks, steel mills, things like that. But planes flying high and fast can easily miss their targets by several miles. Or maybe they can't find their targets and dump their bombs just anywhere. This town, my hometown, even a small village like, say, Little Chapel near West Jefferson. That's why the chief observer briefs the spotters, both men and women, on what to do. For instance, let's say mother's at the pump when a group of planes go over. She takes a good, quick, but careful look, and then heads for that telephone. When the operator gets that important aircraft flash, she knows where to direct the call. In a short moment, the observer is making her report exactly as outlined by civil defense to the filter setter. Now the girl at the filter setter identifies the flight on a card and indicates direction with an arrow on a large plotting table. Ohio has two big filter centers, one at Columbus and another at Canton. Both take calls from specifically defined areas. The filter center is exactly what the name suggests, a place to filter reports. It screens and relays only those which seem to mean business reports on the same flight. That information is flashed to an air defense fighter intercepting station. You understand, of course, those reports may be both aircraft spotter reports and radar reports. Now's where you get your action, Sonny Boy. Fighter commander sends those fighter planes up, ready to intercept that raid. Anti-aircraft batteries are alerted. Most radio and TV stations are ordered off the air briefly to keep the enemy from riding in on the beam. A few will continue to broadcast instructions under a special arrangement. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, we are temporarily leaving the air in conformity with the National Defense Program. Keep your dials tuned where they are so that upon resumption of our service, we may bring you the latest information. Please do not use your telephone during the emergency. Transports and private planes are grounded. And the Air Defense Control Center immediately alerts the civil defense authorities in all the key points that are threatened. Now your modern Minutemen come into the picture. Civil defense volunteers, the air raid wardens, and naturally the police, the firemen, rescue workers, medical workers, public utilities, welfare workers, industrial plants, public warning systems. We're all warned, just exactly like Paul Revere warned the countryside. Only much faster by telephone and radio, of course. Yep, the word is passed a matter of seconds. And then, if it becomes necessary, the public warning signals are set off. That means business. Everyone take cover and be quick about it. Then, if we are unlucky enough to be bombed, the civil defense is ready to spring into action on plans already worked out. Every locality has a director of training and operations who takes over the rescue work using all communications available. Working closely with him is a director of personnel who is prepared to evacuate bombed out areas and provide temporary housing. A director of information is ready with maps and information on key installations such as public utilities, railroad, bus and truck transportation, strategic bridges, underpasses, every type of information needed in case of emergencies. A director of supplies on hand to see that supplies and equipment get to the place where they'll do the most good. And a director of health to direct medical operations, prevent epidemics, and work closely with the Red Cross. All of these local men have the full support of the statewide civil defense, which is prepared to throw its resources into those places where the going is roughest. 
Are you trying to say that today there's a choice between rough, rougher, and roughest in a bombing raid? Aren't you forgetting something? Forgetting? What? This. Well? The big trouble today is that too many people are screaming about what can't be done instead of what can be done. Say, Sam, set up the movie projector, will you? And get out those films of me in the last war. Okay, Gramps. Now, wait a minute, Pop. You may have been great guns as an air raid warden in the last war, but this is different. Yeah, this is different. Sounds like the dying words of the first victim of that newfangled stuff called gunpowder. He just wasn't prepared. Remember Hiroshima and Nagasaki? The main reason they were so completely wiped out and so many died is because they were totally unprepared for anything like an atom bomb attack. Most of our rules for surviving an atomic attack today come directly from lessons we learned from those first atomic explosions. Okay, well suppose we set up a basement shelter and we get an atom bomb. What good will the shelter do us? Depends on how far away we are from the bomb burst. The atom bomb is a lot more powerful, of course, but those blockbusters that fell on Europe weren't very nice to be around either. Here's a booklet the government puts out. Survival under atomic attack. Let's see what it says. Uh, yes, here it is. If you're two miles away from the center of the blast, you're 97% safe. Well, that's a comfort. But what if you're closer? Within a mile to a mile and a half, your chances are 85%. At half a mile to a mile, it's 50-50. And what if you're under the thing? It says here you're a gone goose. In fact, up to a half a mile, the odds are only 10% in your favor. But there's a lot of space in this country, and your chances of being somewhere else are just as good as the next ones. Well, as a matter of fact, you take a chance every time you cross the street, ride in an automobile, or even step in a bathtub. Well, what about the radioactivity that stays around and poisons people? It's a danger, of course, but not as much as you think. If it's an airburst, the danger is usually over in about a minute and a half. And any solid object between you and the bomb is a protection. Blankets over the windows will help shut it out. Clothing is a shield. And even if you are exposed, a good application of soap and water usually will wash the danger down the drain. If the bomb burst is underground or underwater, there's danger as long as the dust or mist is in the air. Rain after an air burst is also dangerous. Well, what about flash burns? It's just a question of keeping covered and keeping undercover, and incidentally, making yourself as small as possible. All set, Gramps. Come on, Mom. Oh, I'll get the lights. Come on, honey. Hey, didn't he do a fine job setting that up, Dad? Oh, you bet. He's done that before. He knows how. Oh, he's very good. <laughs> Here's a nice soft seat for you. Oh, thank you. All set, son? Get your head out of the way, Mom. Okay, here we go. There you are, Gramps. Looks like you're skinnier then. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, a little. There's skinny me teaching first aid. But that's World War II stuff. And it's just as important today. More important, in fact. Naturally, there's more to teach today because atomic attack will bring more casualties. But still, the idea is the same as when Florence Nightingale went out to help the wounded. Same applies to fire protection. Firefighting lessons today are absolutely vital when you think of the terrific heat flash of an atomic bomb and how many fires it starts, even a long distance from the explosion. Remember the cluttered attics? and how we used to insist everyone clean them out? In atomic warfare, that'll be 10 times more important because the fire hazard is greater. And it's still important to have good stoppers for tub and sink and extra containers for water to fight fires, just in case the water supply might fail. There's Jim and John Collier when they were your age, boy. But just see how we prepared in those days. Joe, most of the time during air raids, You'll probably be out acting as volunteer firemen or doing some other job. So it'll be up to you, Mrs. Collier, and the boys to protect your home. One of the worst dangers is fire from incendiary bombs. And that's what this stirrup pump is for. Now, Jimmy, 
Your job is to handle the nozzle. Mrs. Collier, you operate the pump. John, your job is the water supply. It's up to you to keep this bucket filled from those tubs. Now, usually an incendiary bomb will fall through the roof of the building and land on the attic floor. Instantly, it starts to burn at very high temperatures. If worst comes to worst, and this does happen, and the house is to be saved, the family must do it immediately. And be sure to remember, when there's a fire in a closed room, open the door carefully. Otherwise, the flame may shoot out and burn you. When you approach an incendiary bomb, be sure to keep down. Some of them contain delayed action explosives, and if you're standing, they may blow up in your face. And above all, use the spray on the bomb, not the steady stream. You can't put out the fire, but the spray keeps the area around the burning bomb cool and prevents the fire from spreading. It also speeds up the burning action, so the bomb burns out in less than half the time it would take otherwise. The steady stream is to put out fire started by the bomb. But if you put the steady stream on the bomb itself, you'll have an explosion spreading the fire all over the place. As soon as the bomb has burned itself out, you go after the flooring underneath with an axe. The burning temperature is so high, the wood may be charred and smoldering on the underside. That's fine. Now, of course, that may never happen. But if an incendiary bomb should fall into your house, it's all yours. Either you know what to do and have the necessary tools, or you'll be looking for some other place to live. Say, Gramps, why'd they put tape on the windows? To keep them from shattering. Of course, that won't hold with an atom bomb, but heavy blankets do help plenty. Not only for protection against shattered glass, but against radioactive dust and mist. In fact of the matter, a basement shelter is exactly what we're recommending in case of an atomic attack. The best location is next to an outside wall. Make it just as comfortable as possible. And a heavy, solid table is still darn good protection against cave-ins. Food, Gramps! Yep. Atom bombs and oh, a young fella's stomach is bound to start screaming for some good, solid nourishment. Hey, Skipper? Mm-hmm. Naturally, canned goods are best. I'll turn it off. Well, those are a few of the things we learned in the last war. Of course, you can't learn everything at once. There are a lot of things now that are new, but not too new. The blast and the heat from the atomic bomb are the greatest dangers. To protect yourself against the blast, keep covered. Get down low, behind whatever protection is around. And shield your face and neck with your arms and hands, like this. And as for the heat, again, keep covered. Just as you do in the beach to keep from getting too sunburned. Same thing. Keep covered, keep undercover. That's about as simple a way of putting it as I know how. Like this, Gramps? <laughs> <laughs> Not that well covered. <laughs> where did you get my old air raid warden coat? The closet where I got the projector. I found it in an old trunk, but I've aired it out religiously, spring and fall, so it's still good. Just as good as those rules we practiced in the old war. Here, let me try it on. I don't know how this is going to go. Ten pounds makes a lot of difference. <laughs> <laughs> and you say everything fits just as well as in the last war. Just exactly. And I'm serious. The old procedures don't cover today's situation, but the basic pattern does. With certain alterations and enlargements, just as this code needs. <laughs> I think you're right, Dad. I know I'm right. Times change, but there's something about the American way that never changes. It was riding with Paul Revere in revolutionary times, and we see it now, in our modern network of communications, the nerves of today's warning system, the modern Paul Revere. Yep, civil defense is everybody's business, and it's everybody's business to get into civil defense. Well, that's just about what the governor said on television the other night.
Let us understand that civil defense is more than a plan and an organization. It is the recognition on the part of every citizen that in times of peace and in times of war, whenever an emergency arises, it becomes necessary to help ourselves and especially to help our neighbors. The great destructive force of the atomic bomb will undoubtedly temporarily incapacitate a community. Those communities will need the help of their neighbors. It is impossible to overemphasize the need of giving aid to our neighbors in feeding and housing the homeless and in aiding the injured. If atomic bombs fall upon America, everybody everywhere in the untouched areas can look upon the homeless and the injured and say to himself, there but for the grace of God go I. The military forces are doing everything in their power to make preparation for the defense of our nation. But no system of defense is infallible. Hence it is necessary that we civilians be prepared too. If we are, we will be able to dig ourselves out of the devastation. We will be able to help our neighbors and we will be able to avoid the panic that so frequently comes when disaster strikes. Civil defense, let us understand, is not a short-term measure. Until peace again reigns throughout the world, the pattern of American life must include the readiness on the part of the modern Minutemen, and that means you and me, to face whatever comes and to face it squarely.